Welcome, everybody. My name is Denise Boudreaux Scott. I'm president of Drive, and I'm so thrilled to see so many familiar names on here. And for those of you that I don't know yet, I'm looking forward to spending time with you today and getting to know you through our chat over here. Um, I shared with some people when I first got on here that it sort of feels like I should be landing a spaceship instead of giving a webinar with the amount of computers and iPads and everything I have in front of me. But um, so if you see me kind of going around, it's because your chat is over here, my computer, my slides are over here, my notes are over here. Um, so I apologize if I'm not always looking right at you, but no, I am with you in spirit. So today we're really going to talk about making everyone else happy. And this sense of is making everybody else happy, making you miserable. That, by the way, is my dog, Clover. And uh, I know that feeling of wanting to make everybody else happy way too well. Trying to be there for my family, for my volunteer work. And then I'm like, I have to find time to exercise and eat healthy. And then I get stressed out because I need to meditate and find time for that. And did I forget to mention work, right? There's also, we got work in there too. So we spend about half of our time, our waking hours at least, at work. So we got to be thinking about that too. So if you can relate, you are in the right place if you feel like you are sort of treading water day and night. If you are ready to move on from running on this uh, leader's treadmill, so that they, I got a Peloton during this whole COVID thing and they call it the bike that goes nowhere, um, but, uh, but takes you everywhere. And sometimes it feels like that in leadership, right? You're on that treadmill constantly, but going nowhere. And then um, do you see this fancy one? It was supposed to mean like drowning. So you feel like you're failing everyone and are you ready to really stop drowning in that ocean of overwhelm? So if you are here, I know that you are looking for solutions and I have a ton of just awesome tricks and strategies and so forth that you can use to get out of the no win situation that you're in. And um, I've, I've, we've actually called this webinar the no win situation because I heard so many people using those words. I feel like I'm in a no win situation. Everything's coming at me from all these different directions. And I have all this to share with you, but you have got to pay attention. So I know you're super busy, no doubt about it. But if you're like me and you have 20, that's probably a low number for me, actually. <laughs> my, my window browsers are like a beautiful mine. There's like a hundred open. But close your email, close your browser windows, close the door to your office. Or if you're at home, tell the kids like I used to do, unless it's worthy of 911, don't bother me. There must be blood or smoke involved and broken bones. Otherwise, don't bother me till I'm done. And by the way, if you need NAB credit, there is a... Uh, Notice there right on your screen, just click on that button and you can info up, um, email us at info at culture outcomes and get you, um, you can get us your registry number so we can get you taken care of. Um, I love, and I know a lot of you already um, personally, uh, for those of you who don't know my presentation style, I love for it to be interactive. I can't stand sitting in a boring webinar for an hour. So I want this to be super interactive like I'm there with you. So the way we do that is through the chat. So you're gonna type answers, answers to questions. You can share, if you have a question that comes up, please do share it and I'll try to get to all of those either throughout or at the end. But I want you really to, just like if we were in person, to interact in the same way. So I, you could probably tell me, tell I'm uh, super passionate about the work that I do and about helping people that work in healthcare and in senior living, because I've been there. I've been in your shoes. I worked um, at a hospital in acute care. Um, and after that worked at a nursing home and assisted living. And I just remember the days where I was constantly busy and nothing compared to what you have these days, by the way constantly stressed. Uh, and I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but I will, because I think some of you can relate. And by the way, if you can relate, just throw a yes in the chat. But there were days I didn't have time to go to the bathroom. I was going to head to the bathroom and I didn't have time to do that because somebody would stop me in the hallway. Kimberly says, yes. Uh, Jordan says, yes, right? Gina, yes. So you can relate, but don't panic because lots has changed since then for me. Um, and honestly, I can't tell you how often I think, gosh, I wish I knew then 
what I know now. Um, and if I did, if I knew what I knew, uh, if I knew then what I know now, I just kind of feel like I would have spent more time with my kids. These are my my 19 year old twin boys, um, but they were babies and kids um, when I was working in healthcare and senior living. And um, I would have spent more time with them. Um, I would have had staff probably that felt more empowered in their work. I probably would have just felt less overwhelmed with life itself. By the way, uh, if you ever, if you have kids and you think they ever grow up, the answer is no, because this is them, I think at 18 years old in Cinderella's castle in Disney World fighting with swords. So there you go. Dawn said they follow you in the bathroom. <laughs> That's true. Not just the kids, the people at work too, right? I've had that too. So imagine for a minute, just kind of think through this. If you could leave work on time so you can enjoy guilt-free time with your family and friends, instead of thinking like, what am I not getting done? If that undone to-do list wasn't constantly in your head, circling through, what didn't I get done today? What didn't I get done today? And that feeling of letting someone down, which I know I constantly had that feeling that I was letting somebody down in my life, either work or my kids or whoever, right? If that feeling was just kind of poof, magically gone. I want you to think about that because here's the thing. You are not in a no win situation. Nope. I refuse to believe it. This is not a no win situation that you're in, even though it feels like that some days, right? With everyone wanting a piece of you, but for the benefit of you, of your family, of the people that you work with, of your organization overall, you can and you must get control over the stress, the chaos, and the overwhelm that you are feeling today. And you have to get out of what feels like a no-win situation. And you can do that, I promise you, by what you learned today. You honestly, if you start implementing stuff today, by tomorrow, you can start feeling differently. And I just want to see that chat um, for a, a bit. I thought I saw people writing, but nope. So this need to please especially puts us in a no-win situation. And it takes us further and further from the leader that I know you want to be. And I know it took me further from the leader that I wanted to be. And so there's going to be nine strategies that I outline for you today. And they're going to help you to genuinely lead. So it's not, doesn't feel fake, right? There's not, I hated that when I, sometimes when I was, especially when I was a new leader, that I would sort of almost feel like I was wearing a mask and fake things, but I want it to feel genuine to you. Um, and I want you to be able to inspire people, inspire your team. And to do that, there is no people pleasing required, none at all. So I'm going to share with you three major shocks. And for each one of those shocks, I'm going to give you three tips or strategies to deal with each one. And you can use this information, as I said earlier, today, immediately. None of this stuff takes a week or a month or to implement. Because I don't know about you all, you can throw a yes into the chat if you resonate with this one, but I'm all about instant gratification. Like I started a diet yesterday after I got back from New Orleans and I'm planning to get on that scale tonight and see about 10 pounds off. I don't know. I ate plant-based yesterday. I drank a gallon of water and I worked out twice. So I'm thinking scale tonight, 10 pounds off. That's me. I want instant gratification, but you can actually get it. All right. So after I share with you these nine strategies, I also promise, I promise to tell you about how you can learn even more to fast track your way out of the no-win situation that you might be finding yourself in. Annie, hey, Annie, says, yes, absolutely. You can relate to the, the uh, instant gratification. Nikki and Teresa and Lindsay and, and Kimberly says, LOL. Denise said, of course, right? So here is shocker number one. And that is cutting people some slack makes them a better employee. So cutting people slack actually makes them more effective. And by the way, and this one's going to totally blow your mind because it blew my mind when I was researching all of this, it actually makes you more effective too. So Veronica Barber, who is our expert here at Drive on Emotional Intelligence or EQ, so EQ stands for Emotional Intelligence. Veronica describes EQ as simply being smarter with our feelings and that it's this blending of the rational side of the brain 
and the emotional side of our brain. So this rational side and the emotional side are kind of coming together and blending together. And so EQ skills actually fall into two different areas. And those two different areas are first all about you. So it's very personal. So it's understanding and expressing yourself. And the second one is about other people. It's about the ability to manage relationships. And I don't know if you know this or not. I, I did not. Um, that EQ is twice the predictor of I, IQ when it comes to performance. So EQ has twice the power to predict performance than IQ. Did you all know that? Maybe you're all smarter than me. I did not know this. Or maybe you're all mo more emotionally intelligent than me. Throw in the chat if you knew that, that EQ is twice the power of IQ to predict performance. And it's actually been proven that EQ leads to higher patient satisfaction and, how weird is this, cl improved clinical performance. So in high EQ organizations, emotionally intelligent organizations, clinical performance goes up and patient satisfaction goes up. Now that's been studied in hospitals and in healthcare. Sandra and Jennifer and Teresa and, da and Rachel said, nope. And Larry said, um, I don't, I didn't know it, but it makes complete sense. I thought so too, right? And Denise, oh, Denise is the smarty pants. Denise says, yeah, she knew that. Um, and Karen too, Karen knows that too. And so it makes sense that when you think about the improvement in clinical performance and in patient satisfaction, because the work we're doing is caring, loving, emotional work, isn't it? And so it makes sense that it would impact people um, positively as well. So there's a quote in the EQ community that says, emotions drive people, people drive performance. Think about that. Emotions drive people, people drive performance. So that's why we're seeing that better performance, right? With clinical outcomes and so forth. And so here's another kind of just really fascinating thing. As a bonus, EQ actually pays off and it really pays off. And they did a study, not of 10 people, 42,000 people. And it was found that people with high EQs made on average $29,000 more per year. $29,000 more per year they made than people with lower EQs. So think about what you do with $29,000, right? I'd probably go on a big world trip someplace, but maybe you'd buy a car or pay off some debt or whatever, but that's a lot of money, right? $29,000. And here's another thing. For every point that you increase, increase your EQ, your salary goes up $1,300. So for every point increase in emotional intelligence, salaries went up $1,300. So I'm going to share with you three strategies, like I promised, that I want you to do. Not try. I want you to do them. I want you to commit to doing them this week. Nothing I'm going to give you is anything, once again, that's going to take you weeks or months to do. Because you can begin now cutting people more slack and making them better at what they do, and maybe even make more, some more money in the process, right? Put some more money in your own pockets. So let's talk about the three things that you can do. First thing is acknowledge your emotions. Now, this might seem crazy, right? This might seem kind of nutty, but I listened to a podcast last month where the, the speaker said, negative emotions are not a punishment. They are simply an indicator. When your gas tank, so I don't know about you, if anybody can relate to this, anybody ever run out of gas or is it just me? Um, so gas tank on empty is an indicator, or it should be for people like me who just ignore it and keep on driving to see how far can you actually go on that empty tank. But when we have that empty show up, we don't cover it up and say like, oh, I don't want to know, right? I don't, I, I put a smiley face over that, that gas tank because I don't ever want to know when I'm empty. No, we appreciate it because it's telling us something. It's an indicator. And so it lets us know where we are. And when we think about our emotions, it lets us know where we are in relationship to where we want to be. So what I want you to do is acknowledge the emotions within you. Be glad you're mad or sad or maybe excited or maybe you're happy about something, but know where you are. And I want you to acknowledge it as an indicator that gets your attention. 
Because if you don't recognize your emotions, if you don't recognize your negative emotions, especially, they tend to get bigger, right? Now, our good ones don't keep on taking over our lives. It's the negative ones that keep on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you have still have negative emotions going on and you're covering it up and you're not doing anything about it, eventually what happens is it comes along like kind of a two by four and hits you in the head and says, now I'll get your attention. And it could be something like a migraine, or it could be not being able to sleep at night, or it might be weight gain. Um, I had a mini stroke in 2019, as some of you know. That got my attention, and I have no doubt about it. I had it because I was ignoring my gas gauge for too long. So starting today, right, depending on where you are, East Coast, we're at 3 o'clock we started, but depending on where you are, starting today, this is your first strategy that you can try. I want you to name an emotion frustrated or grateful or sad or excited or whatever it is, write it down, not a novel, one or two words, right? On a scrap of paper, right? I got this whole thing here, a scrap of paper you can write it on. You can write it on a journal. You can write it on the back of a bill. It doesn't matter. It seems really simple, but it's incredibly impactful. And I think most of the time, the really simple stuff is the impactful stuff. And I want you to do this for a couple of weeks. It's not a huge commitment, right? Two weeks, oh my gosh, every day. It's one word. So you're gonna be writing 14 words over two weeks. I think you can handle it. I really do. I believe in you. I think you got this. And by the way, you're gonna need this for our next strategy, which is all about appreciating your feelings. Lisa Gangemi said, I knew uh, that EQ is important um, because it makes us sink or swim the presence of EQ. Yes, I, of course, Lisa, you knew that. Hi, Lisa. So now that you're acknowledging your feelings, right? You've written that feeling down. What you need to do is start accepting them, right? Start appreciating them. And this has really been a game changer in my life. And I, I honestly, every day do this. So years ago, when my twin boys, uh, who are now 19, were just a few months old, I went back to work as a nursing home administrator. And I was completely overwhelmed uh, with everything. They cried all night. They screamed all day. Um, I had this uh, crazy, stressful job. I got no sleep. And then one day, I got some of the best advice I ever got. And that is for my Weight Watchers, the leading leader of my Weight Watchers meeting. If I was still going, I probably wouldn't be worrying about my diet and losing 10 pounds tonight. But this came from my Weight Watchers meeting. And um, she'd asked me how I was doing. And I said to her, you know what? I should be happy. I have these beautiful boys I tried so hard to have. And I can afford to feed them. And, you know, my life is so good. I, I just, I should be overjoyed, but I'm not. I'm just overwhelmed. And she said to me, you have two newborns that scream all day. You aren't sleeping. You have a demanding job. You're feeling overwhelmed. And that is exactly how you should be feeling. That is exactly how you should be feeling. And I've never forgotten those words. And in fact, I use them all the time in my head when I'm feeling a certain way and I try to cover it up. I'm sort of toxically positive almost, right? I always, I always try to look positive, spin on everything. I lost $20 on the street yesterday. True story. I went to the coffee store and I was like, where's my $20? And it fell out of my pocket. And my first response was like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy for whoever finds that. They're going to be so excited. And the girl at the coffee shop was just like, this lady's crazy. But that's what I tend to do. Except for when I'm really feeling a certain way and I need to feel that, I stop and I say to myself, this is exactly how you should be feeling. Now, that does not mean I'm not going to try to change what's causing me to feel a negative emotion, but I want to live in it rather than fight it. A lot of our stress comes from fighting feelings that we're having instead of saying, I got this going on. I got this going on. You just named it in the last strategy, right? You named it. That is exactly how I should be feeling. That feeling I just named is exactly how I should be feeling. So those two first strategies are really intertwined. I want you to name that feeling, and then I want you to think about what got you there for the day, what caused you to feel that way, and I want you to simply think, and that is exactly how I should be feeling. Accept it, forgive it, and you're going to grow from what you learn. Now let's talk about how do you bring this to your team? This is strategy number three under emotional intelligence that we're talking about. So we're taking those first two strategies and putting them to your, um, putting them towards your team. 
So we also want to acknowledge for them and accept for them that they have full lives with a lot of stress in it, right? A lot of stress and a lot of joy too. And a lot of that, that is probably unknown to you. So if you can try to understand your employees' lives in work and out of work, the payoff is going to be huge, not only for them, but also for you. And I'll tell you the truth. I told you earlier, sort of sometimes it would feel like I was wearing a mask as a leader, but when I stopped faking it, as a leader, and I started to recognize my own emotions and then tapped into the emotions of other people, it was a game changer for me. And so I would know who had a sick child at home or whose mom was just diagnosed with cancer. And interestingly, helping people deal with their personal lives, and sometimes people get worried about this, and I know for HR people, sometimes it's like steam wants to come out of their ears, but it, this worries you. It's not that you're going to their house and, and fixing all their problems and so forth and mediating between them and their family members, right? But helping them uh, get through some of these things. Like maybe it's uh, someone leaving early to get to a game, a kid's game that they want to get to, or understanding why someone needs to shift their hours a little bit because they're caring for their, their mom at home. A little easing up on that actual actually cultivates more accountability. And so people are shocked by that sometimes. Like, wait, the more we allow people to get away with, the more accountable they are. Yep. It's a bit opposite of what you would think, but people step up to the plate and for their coworkers if they feel like you care. And by the way, they do the exact opposite if they feel like you don't care. So we have had um, incredible outcomes um, you know, with this. I'll tell you when I was a leader, um, when I was a nursing home administrator, um, we went three years, it was almost three years we went with no nursing assistant leaving voluntarily. Nobody left voluntarily. And uh, we were always the highest occupancy in our area. We weren't the fanciest or the newest. We were always the highest occupancy. Um, and now that was years ago. And you might be saying, I know it's different now, right? Because our little excuse flag goes on. Wait, I, it's different now. I'm different, right? So we come up with these excuses. But even back then, the, the turnover was about 70% in our field. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to check in with one person a day personally, ask about their kids, their dog, their garden, whatever, something not work related. And as you make that true human connection, you're going to find that that trust grows. And as it grows, that they're going to be there for you and your organization when you need them. So tell me in the chat, what would it look like? What would be different if your team had lots of accountability? What would be different for you if your team had lots of accountability? Phil, Jean, working side by side with all my employees, managing the COVID pandemic has allowed for more of those personal connections and really knowing your employees. I love that, Phil. By the way, Phil's going to be featured in an upcoming email because every time I send an email, Phil says, another email, Denise, he texts me. So I, I featured him one coming up. So when you see that, Make sure that you look up his email and send him an extra email just to say hello, because he really likes getting lots of emails. Um, Adam, <laughs> oh, you're sweet. Adam and I were in sister communities years ago. So I'm going to move on, but um, let's get moving. So uh, shocker number two, but do please write in that chat what would be different. Donald, Don says uh, less stress. Larry says a little things uh, make a difference to, to your team. Kim says, yeah, we learned a lot from the last year. Uh, Marion said they would be more creative. I love that, Marion. They would be more creative. So here's on to shocker number two. Empathy is a hardcore, badass leadership skill. And by the way, I really debated saying badass in here, but they say it on TV. So I thought, why not? So honestly, empathy builds trust. And compared to low trust companies, listen to this. People at high trust companies have 74% less stress. Hello, wouldn't you like that? 106% more energy at work. They're 50% more productive. They have 29 more percent satisfaction with their lives. And, and they also experience 40% less burnout. And listen to this. This is even crazier. People who show empathy to their staff are viewed by their boss as better at their job. So what does empathy at work look like? It's considering employees' feelings. That's it. And when you do that, you get meaningful outcomes. I'm going to share with you. 
This is uh, uh, our client. This is actually uh, their organization in Atlanta. I don't know if anybody's on from Ren Lenbrook, but Lenbrook is a beautiful high-end life plan community. I know some of you guys know them um, in Atlanta, and they rolled out a pilot to one of their departments, their dining services department at the end of 2019, right? Just in time for everything. And what happened was managers focused on learning more about really connecting people with people more frequently and on a much more deeper level through conversations. And in just one year, they saw their culture score improve by 6%. And this is actually a quote from one of their team members that the conversations became more motivational as opposed to discouraging or negatively impacting motivation and productivity. And so they're actually now rolling that out to the rest of their organization. Um, I don't see anybody on there yet, but maybe they are. Um, and so as Lenbrook learned, as empathy is really a muscle, right? It's a muscle that becomes stronger the more that you use it. So here are three strategies that you can do to build your own, shockingly, and deceptively powerful, right? Because empathy seems really weak but it's not, this is gonna build your empathy muscles. First of all, I want you to look for commonalities with your team members, because when you connect with people through shared experiences or feelings, people open up to you. So a fun way to do this, and some of you, if you've done this with me, throw into the chat if you've been in one of my sessions that I've done this. I know Katie, you've done it with me, and Mary, you've done it with me, um, is to determine five things that you have in common. And I do this with groups all the time, and it's so much fun to see what they come up with when they have to talk about five things that they have in common at their table or in their group. So 10 minutes you can give the group and say five, we have, uh, 10 minutes to find five things that we have in common or as many things as we have in common. And uh, it could be, we all went to Disney World, right? All of our children have fought with swords in the castle. Um, it could be, um, we're all from a military family. Um, any of my Wisconsin people on, when I went to this in Wisconsin, everybody at the table had had a frog pee in their hand. I don't know, it must be a Wisconsin thing. But look for those commonalities. It cannot be we have two ears or we have two eyes. You're gonna be shocked at the list that comes up. And by the way, if you have a big group, more than five people, split it into two groups. You can do this with just three people um, even, so split it into smaller groups. But do this exercise in the next couple of weeks. You can do it in all the different teams. You wanna break down silos but be between departments, have them do it interdepartmentally even as well. Um, Jordan said the best part being an empathetic team is that what, when I do have to provide feedback that is less than positive, it gets taken seriously. I love that, Jordan. Thank you. And they're appreciated versus being offended. Our staff don't want to let us down. That is so beautifully said. I wish I had 10 hours to share all of this with you and get all your comments on here because that is so beautifully said, right? It doesn't feel like judgment. It feels like I love you. I care for you, right? I want to help you and grow you. I love that. Thank you so much. Sean says it's less complaints on the floor. Yes, less abuse. Absolutely. Less turnover and more willing to be educated in our field. So our next strategy, strategy number two for this is really to be quiet and pause. As you can see, I have a problem with that. So this is like the, the pot calling the kettle black here. But how often do you jump into finish people's sentences or interrupt? Silence can be powerful. It allows people to have their moment. So starting today, this is a simple one. When you're with people, here's what I want you to do. Well, for some of you, it will be simple. For some, it won't. Here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to have your phone in your hand and be checking your email or text or whatever. I want, don't want you to be looking at your watch to see what time it is and when this person's going to be out of your office or stop you if they stopped you in the hallway, be done with you in the hallway. I don't want you to be taking phone calls. And now that you've tapped into your feelings more from our first three strategies, I want you to use that emotional intelligence also for some of this empathy. You can try saying something like, that sounds like something I went through. I went through X, Y, Z, and it made me feel, it made me feel really depressed or it made me feel really anxious when I went through that. So tap into those feelings that you're using and use them in a conversation. And so by the way, I want you over these next few weeks to use this once a day in, in conversation, at least just once, at least once a day in a conversation. It could even be with somebody at the coffee shop or somebody at Target or whatever. So let's talk about strategy number three, and that is going back to the beginning. 
And uh, remember, we talked about knowing people personally, and so many of you shared beautiful comments um, from people, uh, from from all of you in the chat about how this is really, you've done this with your team during the pandemic, really connected to people personally. So now we're going to take that a level deeper, and we're going to go back to the beginning. So empathetic leaders are curious about the lives of their team, and they show interest by asking questions. And these leaders also want people to bring their personal values to work so that they have a deeper connection to their purpose at work. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment, too. So stay tuned about the purpose in work and the meaning in work. But for this one, for this empathetic questions that we can ask, I want you to just simply ask people, how did you start working in this field? What, what brought you to our field? Or whatever way you want to say it in your own words but connect back to their beginning. You, I guarantee it, will hear fabulous stories. I cared for my grandmother who lived with us. I took care of a sister who had special needs. My friend in college told me about working in this field and how great it was. Get back to that beginning question. You're gonna be able to tap into that the next time you have a conversation with that person. And you're also going to be able to use that information to make the connection between the work that they do and what brought them to this field to begin with. So make sure to share your story too. Um, and you can throw it in the chat, by the way, if you want to. Um, oh, Doug, good to see you on here. Doug said it's caring about others the way we would like them to care about us. Absolutely, right? The golden rule. So share in the chat if you would. How did you get into this field? You can just do that and I'm going to move on. But share in the chat, how did you get into this field? And what I want you to think about is, do you have the opportunity to set aside three minutes a day to uncover someone's purpose? I'm gonna take a sip of water. Let me know in the chat. Do you have three minutes a day to uncover someone's person? Can you, can you do that? Do you have three minutes that you can actually commit to doing that? Raleigh, Holly says, yes. Jordan says, yes. Lisa says, yes. Kimberly, Nikki says, she got into the field by accident. Yeah. So Denise uh, says, our mutual friend was a CFO. Robert Kovac says, yes, I can do it. Hey, hey Bob. Um, and Denise Cooksey said, yes. So that sense of how much a difference you can make in somebody's life, including yours, in just those few minutes um, uh, to help connect, once again, the purpose of their work to how they actually got into this field and make your connection as well. So let's move on to shocker number three. Are you all curious about this one now? So shocker number three is focusing on your mind helps you from actually losing your mind. And so this is our last shocker. And uh, to me, this is a pretty mind blowing one. But it turns out that the more that you focus on taking care of your mind <laughs> actually helps you from uh, losing it, right? From it going, from it going nuts. And so I shared with you earlier that my wake up call came from my mini stroke in 2019. And that was, I'll tell you, a huge punch in the gut. I mean, I said, wait, I don't smoke. I, yeah, I could lose some weight, but you know, I, I'm, I take pretty good care of myself. I hardly ever eat meat. Um, you know, I, there's nothing I've really done in my life that I quote unquote deserve this. But what I did is focused on my mind to figure out what had happened. And what I realized was I was focusing on everyone around me and not me myself. And so I had this life of saying yes to people and then stressing out about how I was going to fulfill the thing I said yes to. Because I don't just say yes, I have to. And tell me, by the way, if this resonates with any of you, just throw a yes into the chat if this resonates with you. I don't just say yes to stuff. I have to run the committee or I have to take on the huge project or I have to have that thing be the best thing that could ever be. You can't, I can't just get it done. It's got to be completely overdone, whatever I do. Um, and in fact, actually, when I was having twins and I told my mother I'm having, I'm pregnant, my mother said to me, of course, you couldn't just have one baby. You had to have two. <laughs> So Elizabeth and Robert said, over the top, all caps, yes, Robert, you can, Roberta, you can relate, Roberta. Heather says, oh, yeah, so this resonates with you a lot, a lot of you. And so by doing this, though, I constantly felt like I was in this no-win situation. I was saying yes to everything, and it made me truthfully lose my mind in the fact that, you know, I talked about earlier the two-by-four that comes and hits you in the head. Well, it came in the form of this mini stroke. And 
doing that yes to everything over the top, as Roberta said, is probably also making you lose your mind as well. So I want to share with you st three strategies to save you from losing that precious, precious mind of yours. Um, and you'll hear me trip over my words. A little, it's a little bit of um, my residual of that is you'll hear me trip over my words a little bit, or at least it sounds like a good excuse, right? Um, Phil said, I learned to delegate and then run it. Yes, exactly, Phil. <laughs> I know it well, right? So Phil said, yeah, I delegate and then I run it. Nikki said, I used to be that way and I've learned over the years to do better. Good be you, Nikki. Um, and Don Denise said, oh, you got me into the field because we worked together 20 years ago. If you were on the webinar earlier, I said I had worked with Don in uh, 20 years ago. So Don said, you got me into the field, never worked in long term care. And you said to me, you don't work here, you learn, hear the regs, learn them, and you'll be great. <laughs> that was 1999. I love it, and I've never looked back. All right. Hopefully, I set you off good. <laughs> so um, uh, Jill said, I try to be everything for everyone and lose myself in the meantime. That is exactly what I'm talking about, Jill. And I think a lot of us, if we're honest with ourselves, can relate to that feeling. And Sean, I said she's uh, nursing was introduced to her, and she's 20 years as an aide and now a nursing home administrator. So saying yes. And doing things big, right? As Phil said, delegate and then take over, right? It feels really good for our ego. We get to tell people, I'm so busy, right? And you feel important to yourself and you seem more important to other people. But being that be busy, saying yes to everyone is literally killing you. And because of my personal health crisis, I am incredibly committed to getting rid of overwhelm because stress really honestly costs me almost my ability to walk and to talk. And, uh, and can you imagine not hearing this accent? Can you imagine if I lost the ability to talk and you didn't get to hear this accent? But seriously, I think about that sometimes when I'm getting overwhelmed. I say, nope, this is not worth it, right? I almost lost the ability to walk and talk. And so I'm committed to never going back there to that level of stress again. And I'm going to share with you three strategies for this last shocker to focus on mindfulness. And I'm, these are things that I have used, and that includes saying no. Phil, listen up, buddy. Listen up. So here's the first strategy. Next time you see Phil, he's going to have his hand in your face. Talk to the hand. So it's my quick test. To, honestly, this is, this is how I make decisions now. If somebody asks me to do something, I pause a little bit before I answer. And by the way, if you need to tell them you get back to them, you can pause if you can. If not, you'll get back to them. And I ask myself, if my doctor just told me I had to remove all the stress from my life, would I do this thing? Would I do it? If my doctor said, get rid of all the stress in your life, would I do this thing? Does it bring me joy? I put it through that filter. Does it bring me joy? Is it a hell yeah, I want to do it? Or is it oh gosh, I feel bad. Oh, if I don't say it, they, they won't like me or they'll think less of me or, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't want to make them feel bad. I think about, is it going to result in me producing mediocre results for the things that are hell yeses to me and that are important to me? like the work that I actually love doing. Doug strikes on here and Doug, Doug had um, invited me to be on the New Jersey um, Licensed Nursing Home Administrators Board a few months ago. And that to me was a hell yeah, I wanted to do it. I wanted to make a difference in our field. So uh, that to me was an easy yes. Um, but there might be things that you have to say no to, right? Because you want to go to your kid's game and get there on time, or you want to give yourself to the work that's important to you. So saying no sometimes feels like you're saying no to that person. It feels personal. It feels like you're saying no to them, not the request, but it's not. You're saying no to the task they've asked you about, and it's not always personal. So practice saying no. This is your task. Practice saying no at least one time this week. That's it. Just one time. And by the way, practice it in, an, if you don't feel comfortable doing it at work with your friends, with your family, practice it in a neutral setting. Once again, coffee shop, Target, wherever, practice saying, no, I won't do that. And by the way, this is going to get easier as you focus on these next two strategies that I'm about to share with you. Let me see what this chat says. Uh, oh, hi, VJ. VJ is my college roommate. Um, yeah, Doug, thank you, Doug, for bringing me on. Awesome, Sean. So let's talk about empowering happy people. So we talked a lot about the sense of it's not your job to make everyone happy, right? When you saw the, the uh, marketing and advertising for this webinar. But um, this sense of empowering to ha 
make empowering people to be happy is a bit different. So the second strategy to stop you from losing your mind is to empower happy people. And so when people are happier, they experience less stress, less fatigue, wouldn't that be nice? And they show better team cooperation. And when people are happier, they show better problem solving. And you know what better problem solving means? You know what better team cooperation means? They come to you for less stuff. And you don't have to keep saying yes to things you don't want to do. You won't even get a chance to use your no because they're going to stop asking you. So actually brain scans, and I'm a complete nerd, and I think this is so fascinating, but brain scans show that when people are introduced to uh, or instructed to list out their gratitude daily, there is an increased activity in their part of the brain that is associated with happiness. Now, of course, once again, on a stress, it is not your job to make people happy, but you can lead them down the path to happiness, or at least to gratitude uh, by having sort of this grateful mindset in your organization. And when you do that, happiness kind of just comes along for the ride, right? So you're doing this grateful mindset in your organization and you personally setting the example and you're bringing happiness along for the ride. So here's what I want you to do for this. I want you to start by beginning each meeting with a positive. You can start tomorrow nothing to plan, nothing to do. You can just say, it takes, by the way, I do this every morning with my team. It takes not even 10 seconds a person. And it could be personal or professional. By the way, the more personal stuff you share, we're going back to those beginning strategies. It helps you connect with people on a personal level. So you share some personal stuff. So you're encouraging other people to share it as well. If you as the leader are just always sharing work stuff, everybody else is gonna share work stuff too. So keep in mind, being grateful is literally good for your mind. So 10 seconds, give everybody at the meeting and just say, share your positive for today. I don't have it here, but my, oh, I do. My positive was I got a new water bottle because I told you I'm trying to drink a gallon of water a day. Look at this baby. Look at that. That was my positive for today that I shared with the team. Somebody else shared that they went for a great walk yesterday. Now it's getting nice in New Jersey. It does not have to be anything incre incredibly impactful. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. And our third strategy to help you from losing your mind is to help create meaning for people. And I referenced this earlier when I talked about asking people how they got into this work. So in the work environment, when there is a shared sense of purpose in work, staff are more likely to feel satisfied with their job. And when people are more satisfied with their job, their performance is better. And guess what happens then? They make decisions on their own. And guess what happens then? They don't come to you. Once again, you're not even gonna be able to use your no because no one's gonna be coming to you. So the more connection people feel with their work, the more satisfied, the more decisions they're making, th that sense of they can do things on their own, they're not gonna come to you. So Adam Grant, I don't know if you all know Adam Grant, the author, I'm like a girl fan of, her, of his, but um, he researched this concept of meaning with, with staff that worked in a call center. So he wanted to look at what meaning at work, what, what it was all about. And he did this with a call center and he did it. Tell me in the chat if anybody um, else got, uh, uh, has done this, but my job when I went to, I went to University of Scranton undergrad and then Cornell graduate school, but undergrad University of Scranton, VJ, you might remember this. We had the job of we had to call people and ask them to give donations, the alumni, and that was our job. So we had to call them and convince them to give uh, donations. By the way, I never knew who was getting that money, where it went or anything. I just know, kept dialing the phone and act nice and be uh, kind to the alumni so they give you money because we get things like free pizza parties if we did a good job. So um, by the way, I did a great job at that at both Scranton and Cornell. But anyway, so I digress. So if you ever need someone working your call center, I'm your woman. Um, Adam Grant goes to this call center and looks at meaning at work. And he arranged for one team to meet with an actual beneficiary of somebody, somebody who got a scholarship. So all this money they're raising, they he met one team, met with just five minutes with somebody who actually was a beneficiary of the uh, scholarship fund they're raising money for. Well, those five minutes paid off because that team went on to raise three times more money, three times more money compared to that control group. Because when people see how their efforts have a genuine impact 
on the lives of others, even mundane work like calling people for money becomes more rewarding. So imagine this, imagine the difference this concept of meaning could make in our field, right? Where we have such incredible purpose, we're changing lives, we're saving lives every single day. So I want you to bring this concept to your own work by writing down one thing that you do each day that has made a difference. Because you're going to start by modeling the way. By the way, this will make you feel so much better about your day too. When you go home and you feel like, oh my gosh, I got nothing done. This is a game changer for that. So the end of the day, or we could start in the beginning of the day for the day before, write down one way that you made a difference. Not a novel. Maybe you helped a team member with something. You could write, help Sally. That's all it is. Or maybe you um, spoke to a patient for a, a little bit and made them feel better, right? You can just make a note of that. One quick note. And then I want you to think about sharing that. Because remember, this stuff is contagious. The more connection that people have to their work, the better their engagement is at work. And the more engaged your people are, the less time you spend helping them out, right? You don't have to motivate them. They're self-motivated. And so now, once again, Eureka, you've just freed up more time in your day. See, I promised you I'd get you out of that no-win situation, right? So tell me, how does saying yes too often negatively impact your life? When you say yes too often, what is the impact that it has on your life? What is the negative impact that saying yes too often has on your life? Share with me in that chat there. I'm going to check out some of these questions here. Uh, VJ says, I still get those calls on alumnus. Now, now you gotta be, now you gotta be nice about it though, VJ, right? Andrea said, I love the happiness advantage. That's a great book. Yes. Denise said she got an employee signed up for health insurance for the first time. Oh my gosh, Denise. She got an employee signed up for health insurance for the first time in her life. She was crying. She was so happy. Oh my gosh. Okay. Holly, it impacts you because you're running out of time when you say yes too much. Deborah said it's exhausting. Jordan said you get cranky, right? And then you get cranky, not only at work, but you get cranky with your friends and your family. And they're like, what the heck did I do? Why are you treating me like this? Right? I shouldn't be putting those words in your mouth, Jordan, but that's what happens to me. Roberta says, I expect more, more and more, right? People expect more of you too. Tiffany says it's exhausting. Lisa said it's, uh, you feel overwhelmed. Kathy said you feel overwhelmed, right? Overwhelmed, guilt, resentment, right? Doug said saying yes to the wrong thing doesn't leave you with time for the right thing, right? There is a price to this, right? Not only your health, but it's also the ability to do what you really want to be doing. Kimberly says it keeps me from spending time with my family. I know that well. Fern, hi, Fern. Too much to do when you get frustrated. Faris is feeling obligated and resentful. All the water leaves my ocean. <laughs> And I'm just salty. I love it. All the water leaves my ocean and I'm just salty. That is hysterical. Stormy says, I'm feeling like I'm doing so much. Oh, yes. But not doing any of it with full attention. Mediocre, 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 mediocre. Instead of get one thing done right or get two things done right. Stormy, thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that. So can you all relate to some of these things uh, that people are saying, right? Erica said, emotionally and mentally exhausted. I love it. So I told you earlier, there's something that you can do about it. Put into place these nine strategies I just shared with you. And in just a minute, by the way, I'm going to give you a 10th strategy to share with you too, but think about these nine strategies that we reviewed today. You're going to be getting a recording of this, so you can go back to these and watch them and share them with your team. And I promised you earlier that I would tell you how you can learn even more strategies to kind of fast track your way to control and to keep you out of this no-win situation for good. Because I don't want you feeling like you're overwhelmed and you're exhausted. And I see all these comments in the chat here. And I love this. My ocean is dry. And how funny. I didn't even know that you'd write that comment. My ocean is dry and all that's left is salt. And I'm cranky with the people I love, right? The ultimate no-win situation is, is being captive to your stress, right? It's holding you captive. And that kind of life cannot get you anywhere good. Burnout, breakdown, right? Here's my resignation letter because I can't take it anymore, right? I'm out of here. And so usually what do you hear for stress reduction tips? Do you hear things like, how about a massage, right? A massage with like, you know, for me, it's like a tip and a massage and it's like $200 later, right? And it feels good for an hour. And then by the, that night I'm stressed again or a round of golf, right? Or, or even if you do a long weekend away, it creeps back up with you. But these solutions I just shared with you are available to all of you to deal with your stress, um, are they quick fixes? Some of them, yes. Some of those things I just shared with you, the massages, the golf and so forth. Um, and they're expensive 
too, right? So I shared with you some strategies that are going to stick with you longer than those quick things. Because if you're just doing that quick stuff, the benefit that you get is really fleeting, right? It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. Um, and so, uh, and I even think, you know, if when I took a weekend away <laughs> or a vacation, do you feel like you just go back to more work then? <laughs> so I want to ask you if I can take a mi minute of your time to show you the way that you can actually put something that's not fleeting, that's not just quick fixes, that um, is really sustainable into your life because you have two choices right now. You can do option A, which is what you learned today and then keep on looking for other strategies to help you reduce all this overwhelm. Trust me, I did this option. Right? That's how I've spent my time the last 18 months, spending hours a day reading, uh, listening to podcasts, interviewing people that I wanted to learn from, watching countless videos about um, people that um, really inspired me uh, because I never wanted to be in that same position to have that mini stroke again. Um, and some of what you're going to learn if you do option A is going to work for you. It, it might work for people like you who have 24-7 jobs. A lot of it won't, quite honestly, because of your job. Uh, and you'll learn that through trial and error. But instead of wasting that time that maybe you don't have, um, and when you're trying to deal with stress anyway, adding even more stress to you, um, or trying things, like I would try stuff and it would not work, right? It would not work because I didn't have the time to do, I can't sit under a tree for an hour and meditate, right? So um, trying stuff that doesn't work wastes your time and stresses you out as well. I wanna give you another option. And because this is, as you can see, uh, something I'm really, really passionate about, and I want you to be in a better place next year at this time. And option B is if you're really committed right now, because you can speed up your success if you're serious about getting rid of that stress in your life. If you're serious about making yourself a priority, which I learned the hard way to do that, and um, getting there faster. So you probably are used to putting up this brave face for everyone, but on the inside, you're kind of consumed by a million worries. Does that sound familiar to some of you? The sense of it's... Um, a brave face, but yet you are uh, have a million worries inside. So if you're burnt out as a leader, it's costing you. Um, it takes this silent toll physically. It uh, takes a toll, I heard in your chat already, relationships in your life. Um, your family feels that they want the normal you back, trust me, and it hurts you professionally. Your team needs you more now, right now, than they ever have before, right? They're near burnout themselves and they're looking to you for motivation. So let me show you what is possible because uh, this is fascinating to me too, the, some of the research I did for this presentation is that stressed out leaders produce second rate results. And some of you shared some of these things, right? Karen said too much on your plate and you can't focus on any project or give it 100%, right? Each thing I take on is not 100%. Patty said I work longer and longer hours, right? And so I know that you're not looking for mediocrity at home or at work, that you are looking for to be the best that you can be. So what if I told you today, starting today, right, using some of those strategies, but in addition, using the strategies you'll learn in the stability zone, that you can develop skills you need to handle stress and to handle overwhelm, and that you didn't need to wait weeks and months or years to feel better. So what is the stability zone? It is my go-to, go at your own pace, on-demand, online program. I like to think of it as kind of Netflix for your stress and overwhelm. Whenever you want to sit down and watch it, it's there for you. And it has bite-sized videos. So you do not have to commit to sitting down for an hour or even a half an hour. There's not even a 30-minute video in there. They're all short uh, clips. And so I consider this your 10th strategy. I gave you nine strategies. You could start using those today. And this 10th strategy is available to you as well. And so this is not a program for everyone and anyone. It is, I only work with healthcare and senior living leaders. And so, um, because I think what the stresses we have are unique in our field. And so I want you to really think about the fact that you not only have your own lives in your hands, you have other people's lives in your hands, right? They're in your team members' hands as well. So you can't just say, okay, it's five o'clock, it's quitting time, I'm going home. Or, um, you know, it's, I'll, I'll relax this weekend, right? It's a 24 seven hour job. And so you need a fix for your stress and your own well that has staying power and that is not this temporary improvement. And I want you to teach you what you learn to your team so they can benefit too. So the stability zone is 
Um, really, once again, all on demand. And it's about you not burning out. It's about you not giving up because you've worked too hard. You told me how you started in this field and these beautiful stories, and you've worked too hard to get where you are. And I don't want that for you or for your organization. And so I know you're probably curious about the price. I would be too. Um, and because it's hard to kind of think about, okay, how do I put a price on some of these things that you, um, just, you know, that you just shared, um, like your health, how do you put a price on that? Or you put how do you put a price on your sanity? Or how do you put on price of making your kids soccer game or uh, having the time for a stronger relationship or family at, uh, dinner with your family at night? And so um, that sense of, you know, even when you get off track, if you do some of these nine strategies and you're going to get this presentation, so you'll see those nine strategies again, even if you do those nine strategies, when you get off track, because you're not the Dalai Lama, you will get off track. Trust me, I get off track too. And I've been working on this stuff for a long time. Um, how can you get back? And that's what the stability zone will show you. And this is uh, just one comment from our friends in Indiana, actually, about um, being at the breaking point. So the stability zone investment is $247. And that is for lifetime access. So $247 for lifetime access. And um, that is for strategies that we know are going to work for you. I know they'll work because I've used every single one of them myself. myself. Um, it's better than a massage or a golf or whatever you're going to spend that money on because it sticks with you. So you will get immediate access today to the stability zone. And once again, you have it ongoing. So if you want to go back a year from now and look at something, you can go back and do it. So the guarantee I have for you is um, I want you to be happy. Um, you probably see how passionate I am about all of you and the work that you do. So we have a money back guarantee. I don't know if you've ever gone to a conference or a webinar where they say you got 45 days to say I didn't get anything out of it. Um, I want my money back, but that's how confident I am in this program. So you have 45 days, do the work. If you didn't get anything out of it, we refund your money, no questions asked. So that's your choice. Uh, you can take the information I shared with you today and try to do it on your own, which you'll get outcomes from. Um, or if what I share with you resonated and you know there's even deeper work that you want to do, you can invest in the stability zone for $247 and know for sure that you'll gain uh, control back in your life. Um, we talked about why the stability course was worth it, but there's just one more thing. And it's the last thing I want to share um, that I want you to consider that early on in this course, you're going to get two strategies early on in the stability zone. You get two strategies that are life changing for you. And I don't use those words lightly. Both of those strategies, I go back to time after time after time when I'm feeling stressed out in my life. Uh, or have you ever had that feeling like I hate everybody in the world? Yes, even I get that feeling. Um, when I get that feeling, I go back to these two strategies. And so um, you could be on your way by tonight to feeling better. And actually, you could use these two strategies today to start feeling better and get a better uh, sleep tonight. So uh, we are at time. But if there are questions, I'm happy to stay on and take them. Gina, you are awesome, too. Thanks so much for being here. I love every one of you for the work that you do in our field. And I want to thank you for sticking with your residents, with your team through this last year. It's been insane. And a lot less people would have ran away from the work that you do. But here you are showing up through the stress, through the overwhelm, feeling you're like, like you're in that no-win situation, but you're still here. So I want to thank you from that from the bottom of my heart. Whether you decide to take the choice of using the nine strategies and doing that on your own, or you want to go deeper and you know you want sustainable change in your life, either way, I'm here to support you and I appreciate you and love you for the work that you do. So thanks. And I'm happy to take questions.